This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, this is Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. Today, we're hearing from a few members of the investment community. First, Jim Sledzik, partner and U.S. president for the venture capital firm Energy Ventures. Next, we hear from D. Verma, managing director of the $6 billion private equity fund Quantum Energy Partners. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers. We have with us today Mr. Jim Sledzik, partner and president of the Houston office of Energy Ventures. Jim, great to have you on the show. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate now, the opportunity. Did I hear that uh, you've got some good news? We do. Energy Ventures recently, in, uh, back in April, we closed our fourth technology fund. So that was $350 million at, at our hard cap of what we were trying to raise. And uh, it is a technology fund which focuses really uh, on, on petroleum-related technologies. So we focus uh, almost exclusively on upstream oil and gas technologies that, uh, that help cleaner uh, extract uh, hydrocarbons cleaner, more efficiently, uh, and, and natural gas is certainly one of our other key focuses too. So Now, at what stage are you investing? Is it all early stage, any late stage? So we are venture capital, so we focus on, on early stage and I would say early growth as well. So those are the two areas of, of, of our uh, focus uh, as far as company stage. So we'll do some investments which are quite early, pre-revenue uh, type of investments. Some of them are post-revenue that are getting close to cash flow uh, uh, break even or cash flow positive and really right. need some some money to scale and, and internationalize and grow. And are most of these companies Texas based, US based? That's a great question. We have 29 investments since the formation of our first fund and we have about 750 million under total management. And uh, of those 29 investments, uh, it's very close to being one third over in, in Norway, which is where our headquarters is located. We have another office in Aberdeen, which handles the other part of the North Sea. And that's really probably a third of our companies come from there. And then we opened a Houston office about four years ago. And, and that's where about a third of our, our deals come from as well. All right. So your, your headquarters is in Norway? It is. It is in Norway. And, and the original premise of our, our first technology fund was that hydrocarbons are going to remain the, the dominant energy source of the world for decades to come. And technology was going to continue to play a more and more important role in extracting those hydrocarbons. As it became challenging, we go deeper, we go harder, more tighter rock like the unconventional plays here. Technology plays a fundamental role in getting more out of the ground and finding more. So um, uh, that was really the basic premise. So it started in Norway, and it was really a Norwegian opportunity at that time in investing in technologies relevant for the, uh, the North Sea, mostly. And then taking that outside of the North Sea became a key role to be able to scale technologies which maybe are proven in the North Sea and going international. So that eventually led to the expansion into Aberdeen to focus on uh, on that part of the North Sea. And then, right. of course, the, in Houston and, and in the U.S., which is a very vibrant market for oil and gas technology. And this is where the unconventional boom began. The, the shale gale, I guess, is, is, uh, as I just Sarah likes to call it. Uh, and we agree with that. And then the tight oil, of course, which is the craze uh, right now as well. Let's dig into uh, one or two of these uh, companies. Tell, tell me about this seismic or pseudo seismic company that you're working with. Sure. As we look at um, at the unconventional play and, and the shale gale revolution and what's happening with uh, with unconventionals, uh, the Marcellus is a great example of, right. of a gas field which is uh, world class. Uh, and the development is, is going crazy there. 
one of the challenges that all the the ENP companies have is is 3D seismic and shooting 3D seismic and over these large areas which have never had 3D seismic. So, uh, and the value proposition of seismic is growing in these shales and understanding more about the shale so you can target the sweet spots. Right. The problem in the in the Marcellus is that it's a slow process permitting different challenges uh, and it's quite expensive to do sure. 3D there. So one of our companies out of Cambridge uh, in the UK is called ArcX and they they uh, Arc are X? ArcX. All right. And they do gravity gradiometry uh, which is measuring the change in gravity. So it is an unbelievably precise measurement. So the instrument is is uh, manufactured by Lockheed Martin. ArcX is building their next generation uh, gravity gradiometer on their own in, in Cambridge as well. We've got European technology manufactured by a U.S. company? So it's uh, they have their own proprietary technology in Europe, which they are developing uh, on the basis of what Lockheed Martin here did in the United States, where it, it was really for defense type of purposes. They developed this gravity gradiometry technology. Now it's being applied globally uh, either in a marine environment or in an airborne environment to measure this change in gravity, which provides you very interesting results when, when you're looking at different contrast subsurface for oil and gas firms. All right, so walk me through. They, you're, you're out at the, the, the uh, Marcella Shale. Uh, they're flying a plane over the top. They are, so they are flying, and they're, they're doing a survey right now, which they call Shale Cube. And they are flying a, a survey, so that's the benefit, is that seismic happens on the ground, so there's a lot of issues on the ground. When you take it up into the air, the, those issues are much less. So this is an order of magnitude cheaper than seismic, and it's an order of magnitude faster than seismic. So you can get through big areas quite fast, and you get a 3D measurement, pseudo 3D over large areas. It's not of the resolution of seismic, but it gives a very good idea of the the geology and the high level faults that are coming through this system, which of course is uh, is quite interesting for EMP companies. And then they uh, integrate some additional technology to get a probability of structural complexity map, which then of course, once you cover these big areas cheaply, you can go in and target your seismic in the right places over these large areas. So seismic, definitely more expensive, definitely very valuable. Um, I, I believe that, that all of the shales will have 3D seismic covered in them 100%. That will take time. So what ArcX provides is a very quick, uh, very cheap opportunity to get a look at your geology over a large scale. All right, and, and companies like this, what challenges are they facing? Adoption of technology is probably one of the critical pieces that they have to get and, and convince. So companies that have a value proposition that is very well defined and very well understood by customers, that, that's one of the key steps. You've got to be able to convince the EMP companies that spending the money and understanding the risk profile of it is worth the investment. Right. And I think with ArcX it's very interesting because they're flying. So the risk profile is much less than if you're doing it on, on the ground with seismic and, and it's much faster. So that's E&P companies like the sound of getting data faster sure. and having less risk in doing it. Tell me about the Stanford company you're working with. So we have another uh, portfolio company that's Houston based called uh, Ingrain and they come uh, as a spin out from Stanford. Stanford is a co-investor with us on this and the technology was born uh, Dr. Amos Nur is one of the, the longtime Stanford professors that has been working on rock physics for uh, a long time. A and so Ingrain then formed and we, we invested in them at that time. They take medical imagery, CAT scans and things of that nature, very high resolution, and they'll uh, cores which come from the well bores and drill cuttings or, or something of that nature, plugs from the different well bores, they'll take those rocks and then they'll use their proprietary workflows and imaging to map in three dimensions hmm. what these rocks look like. So it's, uh, it's fantastic. You can see the pore space at a very, very, uh, very, very high resolution you can see these shales and what the producing mechanisms are of these shales, which is somewhat of a holy grail type of concept, and how these shales actually produce oil and gas. So when you get down to the pore scale, that's what they're doing. And then they can image that, see it in 3D, understand the pore space as it moves through uh, a rock, oil and gas, 
interact and water interact in this pore space. Understanding that is fundamental to understanding what the recovery factors are and how you can produce that to extract the oil and gas in the best possible way. Ingrain helps enable that understanding from the, from the oil and gas company. So it's a, it's a process called digital rock physics. All right. For me, it is the absolute next generation of what's coming. And, and I think 10 years from now, uh, you will see this as the absolute standard of what the industry is doing because you have the rock, you image the rock and it, it, it's there forever. You have that image that you can then play with and understand and test your rev reservoir in all different types of scenarios uh, for years to come. Well, Jim, thank you for coming by today. Always a pleasure. And we'll be right back. This is the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. The future is here. You can't see it. It's electric. At NRG, we're providing clean energy and now charging stations to make the electric car a reality. Kind of makes you want a boogie woogie, doesn't it? NRG, moving clean energy forward. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Makers Show. We have with us today a dear friend, Dee Verma, Managing Director of Quantum Energy Partners. Dee, great to see you, my friend. Good to see you too, Paul. There's been a lot of activity over at Quantum. Can you tell me a little bit about not only your position, but kind of what, what the firm's been up to? Sure. Uh, you know, we were founded in 1998 uh, as a private equity firm here in Houston, Texas, and we have and we, 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 we always will be an energy-focused private equity firm, so as opposed to a generalist firm. And uh, we invest across the energy spectrum, so from upstream companies, oil and gas companies, to midstream companies, to power companies and, and renewable technologies and the like. So I think across the gamut, and uh, you know, today, Paul, we've got six billion of equity into management, and we've got some great investors, uh, folks that have been with us for a long time, uh, from insurance companies and pension funds to sovereign wealth funds, uh, uh, people that have, that we're proud to be in business with. And I'd say, as for me, I'm one of the the five partners of the firm, and uh, I spend a lot of my time investing and. In, working with great management teams to build companies. And I'd say we're, we're generally focused on North America, um, you know, lots of stuff in Canada and the U.S. And we've got a few interesting companies internationally, but I'd say we're, we're uh, most of our time and money is spent in North America. Now, one, one of the things that I was excited to see, you know, you and I have talked for years about how new energy, these new renewables groups, will only find success if they somehow learn from those who came before them, right? Learn from those traditional energy companies. And to have traditional energy investors, from what I hear, now going uh, long in the renewable space, uh, to me was very exciting. Can you tell us a little bit about quantum utility, uh, your plans, where you want to invest? Sure. Over? I think, I think what you're referring to, Paul, is one of our new sort of platforms and companies. Uh, we call it quantum utility generation, and it's, uh, it's a neat new endeavor for us. I think we got into that business a year ago, and, and I think you've been, you and I have been talking a lot about that and, 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 and brainstorming on some of that over the past few years. And, and it's true, you know, uh, traditionally we've been oil and gas and midstream traditional hard energy investors. And while we've gotten into the power business in a very big way, and what this business does is it really helps us connect the dots, uh, you know, particularly between the natural gas side of the world that we live in, which in the shale world of today, that's a pretty big part of the energy spectrum in, our, in, our, in, our, in North America now, and, and how that really connects with the power, gas, and renewable side of things was really the genesis of our investment in that business. It's a, uh, it's a platform that's capitalized with a billion dollars of equity. What do you see uh, within the renewable uh, space? Uh, how is all this cheap natural gas going to affect your investments there? Where do you see the activity? Wind, geothermal, solar, what, what's, what's good for us to look at? That's an excellent question. I tell you that cheap natural gas has really been very troublesome for the renewable space. 
uh, what that does is it, it significantly impacts power prices, particularly in the on-peak time frames in a lot of parts of the United States. And, and, uh, and what that has done is it's frankly slowed down the amount of capital and amount of uh, you know, uh, excitement around the renewable space. Because with lower power prices, some of the renewable technologies are not as economic as they were when right. we had 7 to $10 gas. And, you know, things go up and they, you know, what goes down must go up, what goes up must go down at some point in the cycle. And so I think the renewable mandates that states like California particularly have implemented are going to be the bedrock for renewable development. I think some sort of energy policy is going to be necessary for continued uh, support around this uh, enterprise uh, because the fuel math, you know, if you just do the pure mathematics around fuel costs of natural gas plants today versus wind turbines or solar, those are compelling, you know, those are very difficult economics. That, that's for investments in the U.S. How do you view uh, cheap natural gas in the U.S. with uh, solar plays or wind plays in Asia or even Latin America? Uh, you know, when, when you look around the world, getting, getting outside of the U.S. I think a lot of countries uh, are going to embrace some sort of renewable development. I think it's inevitable. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I think the, the, the question always is, with not whether you're going to do it or not, it's about how much uh, and how economic is that and who's paying for those costs. So we are seeing good growth in, wind, in the wind business, particularly in China, for instance. Right. There's a lot of Chinese companies that are doing, um, are making great strides in developing their own wind turbines and technologies and trying to implement them in a major way. I think Europe has always been on the forefront, for instance, sure. of, of the renewable space. I think the economy and the, some of the, the, the sovereign troubles that Europe is sort of working its way through has, again, slowed things down. I think, you know, what we see is that the, the robustness of an economy is an important factor in being able to accelerate the deployment of renewables. When people are pinching in their pockets, I think they become less, less uh, able uh, to absorb higher power costs. And we're seeing a slowdown in Europe. We're seeing some acceleration in Asian economies. We're seeing some, some growth in the Latin American economies. So I think this renewable growth that you're talking about is a global phenomenon. Uh, some places slower than others. One thing I've always liked about Quantum is that not only are you sage investors, uh, but you do think about the public and, and trying to invest in, in ways that not only turn a profit, uh, but, but can truly provide some benefit. Uh, but before we go, can you, can you tell me uh, or update me on what's happening with that portfolio company that's really helping the Native American population uh, exploit some of their own uh, energy resources? Great. I'm happy to do that, Paul. I think uh, what you're referring to is a company called Native American Resource Partners. And that's a great example of, of, of you know, how investing does not have to be buy, lever, flip. I think private equity is unfairly sometimes characterized and simplistically characterized as, you know, as folks that just buy, lever, and flip. Uh, let me expand on that. You know, Native American Resource Partners is a company we founded from the ground up in partnership with a CEO called John Jurius. Now, John's an exceptional entrepreneur and has spent the past 30 years of his life working solely with Native American populations to empower them with their own capital and expertise great. to exploit their natural resources. These are folks, frankly, that have been ignored in, in, in the economies that we live in today. They, they, they are sitting on land and they're trying to develop and, and trying to develop a certain sovereignty and a certain way of life that the rest of us take for granted. And what we have done in partnership with John is built multiple companies and we're committing capital where we will form a tribe, what we call a tribal energy company, where the 50% the, the, uh, of that company is owned by the tribes and 50% of it is owned by us. That in partnership with the council and the chiefs, we will then invest capital and expertise to allow them to develop those natural resources. And we've had a lot of success with that. One of the companies that we have that's come out of that whole process is a company called Ute Energy. And it's with the Northern Ute tribe in Utah. And it's such a fantastic success. 
uh, great natural resources. We think in the next year or so, we may take that company public and create billions of dollars of value for the tribes and for, the, for, the, for our investors. So I think, you know, building great companies is not simple. It's not singularly minded. There can be a lot of constituents that you can serve. And at Quantum, we try and, we try and do a little bit of that with everything that we do. What a great conclusion. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming by. Thanks. And that wraps this week's episode of the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. The uh, Energy Makers Show is heard on the radio nationwide and seen online at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson, and we'll see you next week.